change, and war. Today we seem to be living in a constant cycle or a constant stance of crises. While we as individuals are trying to tackle these locally, the European Central Bank has taken a vital role in tackling these regionally through monetary policy and regulations. To discuss these burning questions that we have on sustainability, on the current inflation, we have the pleasure of inviting Frank Elderson, the executive board member of the European Central Bank. Frank Elderson has spent most of his career working in the legal sector uh, of banks. He was voted onto the executive board of the ECB in 2020, uh, and he has been a vocal advocate in making our money system green. Without further ado, let's invite Frank Elderson, the executive board member of the European Central Bank, onto the stage. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, did you come from from uh, from Frankfurt? Was it a long journey? Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, I came uh, from Spain uh, this uh, this morning. Okay. Where I was for uh, for family reasons. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So it was a. It feels as if it's already late uh, because the day started early this morning. Did you uh, have to wake up early for that then? <laughs> uh, well, to define early, but it was <laughs> it, it was before five. Okay, well, uh, then uh, the, to thank you for being here is, uh, is more than uh, justified, I think. And you are back at your alma mater. Exactly. Uh, so it's very, the, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the two of you, but I should also look at all of you. Um, yeah, for me, it feels as if not too long ago I was sitting there, not here. Yeah. But when you look at me, you will probably think that it's probably a long time ago. But, uh, but yes, so I studied uh, law here at the University of Amsterdam. And actually, um, still in the in the old building, the Oudemann S4, so that is uh, a little bit my place. And actually, here amongst yourselves is one of my um, my um, my student friends, so that is very good. It's not just me from that time. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, you, you said, as you mentioned, you studied law here, but now you work in the monetary and in the financial um, field. So, what does your expertise bring to monetary policy and your role as a supervisor? Uh, this is a very interesting question, uh, I'm, and then we're only just starting. Um, you know, one of the things when you study is that you have a feeling that maybe, you know, life is um, full of um, uncertainty in terms of what you're going to do later on. Um, that, is, that is true, uh, but that's okay. Uh, and it, it never stops, because I don't also don't know what I'm going to do after this uh, this job. So that is that is actually yeah. not not so 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 strange. Um, and sometimes things happen to you that you think, I mean, what am I doing here with what I learned? Uh, because it's true. It's it's it, it, it's actually a very funny thing, isn't it? A trained lawyer. I spent four years in in, in a law firm here. Um, then I joined the central bank, and I'm sitting there in that table with 25. Uh, members of the governing council and we talk about monetary policy. But it's good that at least one, well actually also the president, uh, uh, Lagarde, who was here as well I see, um, is, he is also a trained lawyer and me, but of course he has to, to chair. Um, so, so whenever we take a decision, all these decisions need to be legally sound. Mm. And that's, that's easily said, but not so easily done. Uh, because we have taken some, and, and that was not me, but some years uh, before, some decisions that have been very actively litigated uh, before the European Court of Justice. So it's very important that whenever we take a decision, we look whether um, it's legitimate, whether it's within the, um, the, the, the confounds of the uh, EU treaty, whether it's proportional. So we have to show to ourselves and to the world and to the judges if there is a case, um, uh, whether uh, there were other measures that could have done the same but are less intrusive. Yep. Um, and so whether what we do is really necessary for the aim that we have. So there are a number of legal um, uh, criteria that we have to look at. And it's interesting because when we are sitting around that table and we are discussing these things, somewhat naturally, the other 24 are going to like look at me. Yep. And they would like me to nod, like, yeah, this is still okay. So, so that is a little bit uh, like the, role, the role that I play. So, yeah. so in some way, you are the judge then there. 
if it is okay. Well, I participate in all these conversations, but when it becomes really illegal, and, and again, in all the decisions that we take, there is this test. Is, yeah. this, is this still within our framework? Yeah, because yeah. Um, you, you have two roles uh, in the ECB. You are part of the governing council and of the uh, executive uh, board. And um, I, I was wondering, so the governing council, that is, that is where uh, the decisions get taken. People, people vote on policies. Um, and the executive board, uh, they also oversee the implementation of those decisions. Um, and when we were reading about that, we were wondering, um, is there ever a, a, a conflict between those two roles? So that you feel, oh, this is something I have to oversee as well. It's not that easy. Or, or do, you, do you feel some friction there sometimes? Right. Uh, okay, I'm going to explain. Because this is kind of like a little bit complicated, but I think if I explain, then you can see the different hats that I wear. Um, because it's true, I'm, list, uh, I'm, I'm a member of the executive board, which is the six people who chair, or who are the board of the European Central Bank. And Christine Lagarde is the, is the president, of course, and then there are five others, and I'm one of those. Yep. So that is one, yep. executive board member. Then we have monetary policy. Monetary policy is made by these six yes. plus the governor of each of the national central banks. So you have the Dutch central bank, governor Klaas Knot. Yes. He yes. joins at the table. So it's six plus him. And then the Klaas Knot of each of the participating member states of the uh, Eurozone. Yeah. So the governor of the, uh, the Bundesbank, the governor of the Bank of France, the governor of the Bank of España, etc. Six plus 19, there are 19 um, um, the Eurozone states, actually Croatia is now gonna join as of the 1st of January, will be um, 20 plus six. Um, 26, now we are 25. So I'm a member of the six executive board, I'm a member of the governing council, and I do like this because we actually sit on a round table. Yeah, and it's actually interesting um, because we sit there each on um, order, in the order uh, of uh, alphabetically, of our last names to make sure that we are there on a personal capacity. So not um, representing your country, but in a personal capacity. So I sit um, to the right, um, uh, Mario Centeno, uh, who is the governor of the Portuguese Central Bank, and to my left, uh, Pablo Hernandez de Cos, uh, who is the governor of the um, Spanish Central Bank. And the three of us, we always speak Spanish together until uh, ah, President Lagarde says, order, now, yeah. we need to discuss. So that is two hats, executive board, governing council. But there is another hat um, that you left out so that I could kind of like explain the two, uh, which is supervision. So the European Central Bank doesn't just do monetary policy, and I'm sure that we will be talking about that more, but also does banking supervision. And there we have an organization that is a little bit like this as well. So you have a center and you have representatives from the periphery, who are not really representatives because in the end they are sitting there on a personal level. And there, not to go into all kind of details, you have a chair, who yep. is an Italian, yep. Andrea and Ria, a vice chair, which is me, yep. And then representatives from um, from each of the, uh, the, the the banking union member states. Um, Stephen Mayor is the, um, the the one here from the Dutch Central Bank. So I'm vice chair on the uh, supervisory side. I'm a member of the executive board, mm -hmm. and I'm a member of the company council. Yeah. So you have not two, but even three hats. Do you ever get confused which one to wear? <laughs> well, it's a very good question because the question is: Are there um, inherent um, uh, inconsistencies or um, uh, between that work, yep. um, there could be, mm. um, um, but in general, yep. um, what we try to do is aligned. So it is good for monetary policy that the banking system is sound. It's good for monetary policy that uh, there is financial stability because we need financial stability in order to make sure that yeah. our monetary policy... But, but in, in order to get there, you can, of course, um, differ in opinion about that. Uh, and and I, I could see how that maybe yes. sometimes leads to situations in which you think, I don't know, on the one side for, for the Netherlands, for, for example, this would be very good, or, or, or on a personal note, I think this, and when I look in a supervisory way, away, well, uh, I don't know for sure. Yeah. On a certain level, of course, you have to ask these questions, but I think more generally, um, I, you know, <laughs> because you asked me personally, I think I, I can deal with it. 
Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I'm glad. And, I'm glad. Um, yeah. and, and, and again, if, uh, when we do banking supervision, of course, it's, it's also, you know, the, these are abstract terms, of course, but it's, you know, it, it, it's not abstract at all. Banking supervision has to do, of course, with the fact that banks need to be well capitalized, uh, they need to have um, sufficient liquidity, but they also have to have a fit and proper uh, board member. So if one of you wants to be, a, 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 you know, a, a board member of a bank, um, we need to look whether you are fit and proper. That means, do you understand how a bank works and are you uh, morally and ethically okay? That's more or less uh, how I could uh, summarize that. Mm -hmm. um, so these decisions are, you know, they are very concrete. Uh, here is Elias, and Elias wants to become a banker, and we check whether you are fit and proper to do so. That's a very different judgment call from uh, when you are making monetary policy and you need to decide whether we need to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to hike rates or not. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So, not that much conflict there, you would say. Okay, okay. Well, um, you are known for your role with sustainability and, and trying to, to accelerate um, the actions being taken on that, on that, uh, on that field. And uh, you said in an, uh, in, in an interview that uh, after the 2016 Paris Agreement, there was an increased public interest uh, in taking action against the climate change. Uh, and that motivated you to establish the sustainable finance platform, NGFS. Um, and we, we, we looked into your career, of course, and uh, we couldn't find like any, any actions you took on the climate um, issue before 2016. So uh, could you maybe tell us more about your initial interest in the subject and, and what, uh, what on a personal level makes you motivated um, uh, to, to take action? I need to compliment you because you did super good homework and you're also very critical here because many times people, they just start celebrating all the things that you've done, but you asked, what did you do before 2016? <laughs> yes. Very good question, very good question. Thank you very much. Um, um, so I stand to be accused because I should have done more. Okay, but it's honest of you. We all should have done more. We are way too late. Hmm. So this is not to get any one of you super depressed, um, because what we need to do is to be optimistic and work and be constructive, but we are too late. We should have done the things that we are doing now 30, 40 years ago. When you were uh, in university or even uh, oh, before that? Uh, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, we should have done before. So, yeah. so what can I do as a, you know, as a witness for the, uh, for the accused? When I joined the board of the yeah. Central Bank, um, that was in 2011, yeah. and we had an off-site. So we walked on the beach uh, as a new board uh, together and we got to know each other a little bit. This was already with uh, Klaas Knot, the, the current governor. And we walked on that beach and we decided on our strategy. And I remember that the first line of that strategy until such time had been something that, you know, the Dutch Central Bank does all their, it, its tasks in order um, to, um, uh, uh, to have, um, and I'm looking for the English word for welfare. Uh, welfare, no, not welfare, no, prosperity. Prosperity, here yeah. you go. Uh, for prosperity in the Netherlands. Mm. And I wanted to change two things. I wanted to say sustainable prosperity in the Netherlands, and I yeah. wanted to change the Netherlands into at least Europe. Mm. Mm. Now, I was unsuccessful in changing the thing that yeah. it should be Europe, yep. but in the end, we put sustainability in there. And that is a little word, of course, but if you are working in an organization such as the Central Bank, but any organization, and you have a mission statement, these few words that are in there are super important, because if you want to change something, and you can say, yeah, but it's in the mission statement. Those who are conservative and don't want to change anything, they are a little bit out of business. Because you can say, yeah, but you just agreed to this mission statement. So that little yeah. word sustainability was super important. Mm -hmm. And then, at the beginning, I was responsible for banknotes. Yeah. So in 2011, to come yeah. back to your question, yeah. Yeah. I did ask, so what do we do in terms of the sustainability of our banknotes? Yeah. And there was not much but a little bit, because we had um, I think a pretty low, maybe 10 or 15 percent of the cotton that was used in these banknotes, because you think they're paper, but actually there's cotton in it, was sustainable. Yeah. So I said, why not 100? Mm. And then they said, well, that is impossible. And then I said, not good enough. Okay, okay. So you were then already. That was then. Okay. And then, in, and then a little bit later, in 2014, I think it was, um, I got a little bit of another. Um, Responsibility yep, yep. for pension funds, mm -hmm. yep. and then I started there, and so it grew. Okay, because in 2011 you were already 
uh, asking about uh, what, what are we going to do? Maybe yeah. the word sustainable in there. Yeah. Um, was that because of personal conviction? Did you did you re read IPCC reports or did you uh, think about your children's future? What what sparked the the need to say something yeah. about it? There there is a. I mean, the very personal answer is that. Um, you know, in all our holidays, when I was a small kid, I grew up more or less in Terschelli. Uh, for those of you who know, know. Those who don't know, it's one of the five beautiful islands. Some people think that Tesla is even more important, <laughs> but um, I just heard before. Um, and, and, you know, if I count all the, uh, and I add up all the holidays, I've lived there for more than one and a half years of my life. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, together with my father, we, we took pictures of all the, the, um, the rare, flowers, I was there and I had a seagull, uh, you know, getting out of its egg in my hand. I don't know whether it is still allowed, but at the time, you know, when we did uh, one of these uh, walks, it was allowed. So, so nature has always been very close to me. Uh, but it is also true that you must be completely blind, that even if you have not had that kind of upbringing today, to not see that we need to take action. And to bring it back to the financial sector, the financial sector in and on itself cannot change climate, um, the climate crisis. The, yeah. the financial sector in and on itself cannot address the environmental um, crisis. Because when we talk always about climate, but it's broader. Yeah. Um, it's broader than climate. Um, it's also biodiversity loss. It's also more generally nature-related yeah. uh, services. And, 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 and then you thought, uh, now I'm in a position to, to do something after the, the, the Paris Climate Accord, you found it. NGFS. Uh, we, we looked. We looked up what NGFS does. It's a, um, a, a really big group of banks who want to do uh, something green. And um, when you go to the website, there's something like to define, promote, and contribute to the development of best practices to be implemented within and outside of the membership of the NGFS, and to conduct or commission analytical work on green finance. Me, as a normal citizen, super boring. I have no idea what you do. Can okay. you tell me? Here we go. When you were reading this, I thought, okay, this, this audience... Yeah, 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 you can all go home now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have central banks in the world. And these are funny animals. Because this, this thing about central says something. They, they have a pretty important role in the economy. And I came to the conclusion that although in the end it's governments that have to take um, measures, uh, to combat cl uh, climate change, it's governments that have to take um, measures to um, to combat the biodiversity crisis. So governments enter into the Paris Agreement. Governments decide to have CO2 pricing or not. Governments decide to have a bid for 55 uh, uh, process um, uh, 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 package uh, for the European Commission. Governments have said that in the Netherlands, all office buildings as of the 1st of January of 2023 have to have a C label or better. Governments will phase out diesel cars. Governments will phase out fossil cars. Um, all that creates risks for the financial sector. Um, so you have two causes of risk for the financial sector. And I need to explain this for a second to explain why this group that you're asking for is important. Um, you have physical risks. All of you know the big forest fires, the droughts, the floods, um, the hurricanes. Um, the melting um, of the um, uh, of the ice ice, um, caps, yeah. ice caps, um, the awful possible tipping point of the what uh, received um, uh, gave along. Yeah. Um, then then your balance sheet isn't in. So these two um, um, channels through which the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, translate into financial risk. Now. It is no longer controversial um, because this organization that we founded mm. um, now has more than I think 110 or 150 central banks to supervise around the world. So actually, all of them. And and they all recognize. And they the all recognize this. So they all yeah. recognize one little sentence. And earlier I said, you know, this one little word in the mission statement of DMB at the time. This one little sentence. And of course, there's lots of reports and lots of research underlying that. But that one little sentence that says. Um, Climate change is a cause of financial risks, and therefore, this is part of the mandate of central banks and supervisors. Mm. 
Six years ago, no, no bank, no central bank in the world signed up to that. So they did not believe. So, so I, did, I didn't just sit there, I, I chaired. You chaired? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Active sitting, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Okay. So I tried that. <laughs> so, so on supervision, for example, we made um, a manual um, in which we say, if you are a supervisor out there and you want to supervise banks in a way that you can challenge them, whether they take climate change into consideration in all of the things that they do, this is the kind of things that you should be asking that bank. These are the kind of things oh, that yeah. you should be challenging them on. These are the kind of things that you should be forcing them um, in the end, obliging them to do. So this was the NGFS in kind of like a non-binding way, because this was just kind of like a gathering, just like you are here gathering today, of central banks. Now, to just jump, if you um, allow me, to my current position uh, at the European Central Bank, um, we have used that manual um, of the NGFS to come up with our own and then they were very sincere and honest. And how do I know? Because they were negative. And they said, you know, actually we're not doing so well. So I, I welcomed the fact that the banks were honest, but of course that was not good enough. So then we asked action plans from each of the banks and we said, okay, we want to know, are you gonna move from where you are today to full compliance with our expectations? Um, now, um, this year, we are doing what we call a thematic review in which we go to all the banks. Um, and we check mm -hmm. their progress. Better they, uh, and I've said uh, before that we expect all banks to comply with all our expectations by the end of 2024. Yeah. And that's an example. Speaking about this, speaking about like acting on climate change, in fact, as of tomorrow, October 1st, theoretically, um, the European Central Bank will officially begin its decarbonizing corporate bond holdings. To this, you said that you'll assess a, car a company's carbon footprint, compare it with other companies, look at the objectives set by the companies, and examine the company's transparency in this regard, as you mentioned. We're doing, um, uh, and indeed, I think in our press release, we said we will do this as of the 1st of uh, yeah. October. We have a the 1st of October is a Saturday, so I think <laughs> it will probably be this coming yeah. Monday. Um, but, um, uh, so now we move a little bit from, we talked about supervision, we move mm -hmm. to, to the monetary policy side of things. And over um, uh, the years uh, past, uh, because of reasons that maybe I can explain later, uh, if, you, uh, if you're interested, but we have um, acquired um, certain portfolios of um, uh, corporate bonds, also of government bonds, but also of corporate bonds. And um, um, we have come to the conclusion that there is space within our mandate um, and reasonably so, because on the ECB's main statement is that you want to ensure price stability and not really about necessarily. And therefore, it says in the um, uh, in the European Treaty that um, we have a primary objective, and our primary objective is therefore also our primary concern. So what we do, and that is um, price stability. Um, so that is what um, our main focus is. But there is also a secondary objective. And the secondary objective for the lawyers uh, uh, among uh, us um, is that uh, it's important because it starts with the clause that's very important that says without prejudice to the primary objective. So first we have to make sure that we focus ourselves on primary objective, on price stability. But um, if there is then different ways of going about that, mm. and there are many times are because we have a lot of instruments and within these instruments we can also play with, with different modalities. And one of these um, modalities contributes not only to price stability, but we, yeah. we can we can we claim that we um, uh, buy more uh, green bonds, uh, corporate bonds, and less non-green bonds. I used to. You're, you're, you're welcome to be not And, uh, and we will have um, uh, we have a, a, a system yeah. in which we rank uh, these bonds, um, looking at uh, looking backwards mm -hmm. to those who have emitted these bonds, um, uh, what, their, what their carbon emissions are, um, uh, looking forward yeah. uh, in terms of what their, their, their plans are, and also looking at their disclosure. So we have an, an, an internal methodology that will enable us to do this. And this is part, this is important because you, you took this. Uh, and, and so for the banks, or not the banks, the companies that will exceed the carbon threshold, do you have a plan? Uh, in dealing with them, or is there any way that the ECB will be assisted? Be, you know, up to the market to, to, to react mm -hmm. to, um, to what we have said here. Actually, 
we are now lo no longer in a um, in an active bond buying phase. So we are not um, enhancing any longer uh, mm -hmm. our um, uh, our bond holdings uh, because of the fact that inflation is way too high. Uh, we are, um, um, you know, uh, uh, I can explain later if you want to yeah. uh, on a path that um, uh, part of which is that we no longer. Um, have net purchases, so we don't expand the bond holdings. No, yeah, yeah. But we, uh, for now, uh, do reinvest uh, bonds that um, that that, that yeah, into green mm -hmm. and there we can uh, we can fill. Okay, mm -hmm. and, um, and we will. I, I imagine the, the, you you had a lot of a lot of discussion about uh, how to do bonds of the ECB. Yeah. Where, where does it lie? Yeah. Um, this comes back to what I said earlier in terms of all the things that governments do. Governments are climate policy makers, we are climate policy takers. Um, so we are not gonna solve the world's climate crisis. Mm -hmm. But we need to play a role, and we can play a role, and we do what we can within our mandate, by pushing the banks in the way I just, uh, I just told you, and many more things, and by, on the monetary policy side, within our mandate, finding ways to contribute. Yeah. Um, but if that were the only thing that happens in this world, then uh, the, no. the whole society. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, whole society. It's not just. Yeah. Not just no, but so, yeah. so, so there's a do our part. Yeah. yeah. Even if that in the end is not going to change the whole world, we do our part. We send a strong signal to the financial markets that mm -hmm. this is important. Yeah. Um, and but when you talk, they listen. Yeah. Now we had, um, so we have committed to 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 Paris compatibility mm -hmm. in terms of our um, of our actions, um, and we have said. We, um, we now have a number of measures, of which the stilting is the, the one that is now the, the most prominent, um, but we are not married to this um, action plan forever, um, because there's a revision clause. There's a clause that says, yes, I, I presume. we will be, um, we will be uh, disclosing mm -hmm. uh, um, in the, the corporate first, uh, first part of the end of the first quarter of this coming year. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, uh, well, and, and on that note, you talk about the ECB dealing with other threats to the monetary system in, in terms of finance, and um, you say climate change is one of them, but should the ECB then also be responsible for other, for potentially like? So the ECB has a very clear mandate, and that is price stability, mm -hmm. um, and that is indeed different from how, um, how this is in some other jurisdictions, notably uh, in, uh, in, the, in the US. Um, of course, unemployment is extremely important, uh, or employment, in terms of under but do you think it should um, i think that we are well served with the mandate that we have okay so no you know i'm a little hesitant in the sense that you know it's not for the one who has the mandate to tell how the mandate should be mm -hmm. um, what we have i think gives us the possibility to do what we need to do and that is by the way as we speak of course now bringing inflation down uh, to our okay, we, we can, let's we can let's deal with the things that we need to do with the let's, um, yeah. let, let's focus on something uh, everybody is, I think, noticing. Um, could you raise your hand uh, if you have noticed that prices are going up? <laughs> well, um, and, and th I think th this is also is impacting your day to day job because th th this is what you try to control with a pivot two percent take today. There was news that in the eurozone in all of September it was 10 percent inflation. Right. Um, and we, of course, have to wind a little bit, a little, little bit back to where this started. Um, inflation in the eurozone hit. Um, so inflation is way too high. That's clear. And all of you raise your hands, and you you could see it. By the way, the inflation in the Netherlands. This the, the, there was also a number coming uh, mm -hmm. out. This was, I think, 17.1. Um, and um, uh, that is, of course, even higher. Uh, yeah, huge uh, uh, gas prices. Uh, Another story. We have had many years of way too low inflation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so many of the um, uh, uh, the actions that we took um, um, were meant to, to fight yeah. too low inflation. Yeah. And then um, it's uh, it's changed. Exactly. So what we have seen um, uh, because of uh, uh, COVID, uh, but also because of the war. Mm -hmm. um, and now that I say this, this completely unjustified attack on Ukraine by Russia, um, they they have changed that picture radically. Can explain so, a bit so more. So, you, 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 so you before we raised yeah. interest rates for the first time in July, 
Um, you mark percentage, mm -hmm. um, percent, which in our world is a lot, mm -hmm. uh, because of a number of things that we did. Yeah. These are tech. I, I could see how hey, when everybody raises his hand, you, you go to Albert Heijn and you know this yourself that the pri prices are raising. Um, are you feeling frustration that you think we as an easy? Um, I, I noticed when I go to the Reden, because I now uh, live in Frankfurt, um, of course, when you have a 2% price stability objective, mm. um, when you know how these high inflation numbers translate into many people around Europe not, you know, not getting to the end of the, of the month, yeah, yeah. Um, knowing that you know, if some people um, are um, you know, um, having to maybe face the choice between eating or eating, as yeah. the, you know, the technology yeah. that at least in you know the UK press has come up uh, quite a lot. Um, of course, we are very much concerned, but yeah. don't underestimate our determination to make sure that inflation will come back to our medium-term two percent target. So we are doing all the things needed yeah. to make sure that that happens. There's nothing more you can do today. You will adjust. We will look uh, to that and assess yeah. that meeting by meeting. Mm -hmm. On the basis of the information we have today, we will be um, uh, continuing uh, to hike to make sure that um, um, demand um, in the end adjusts to, to, uh, to a lower supply yeah. and to make sure that there is no de anchoring of inflation expectations. Uh, exactly on that note, um, that we take mm -hmm. to avoid that um, people, when they look at current inflation, um, so the inflation that we see today, um, it's important that in people's heads, in the heads of people that, um, uh, that have roles in the economy, um, they, they continue to trust that in the medium term, um, this price stability of 2% is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And um, so what we see is that because we look at that, so we look at inflation expectations, and there are different ways to look at that. You can do surveys, you can look at uh, markets, because you can also trade uh, with these expectations in various ways. Um, so we look at that. But you mentioned that now, uh, obviously what the ECB is doing is also very important. Um, but uh, as of now, we also see national governments giving out subsidies, for instance. Well, excellent question. Um, it's very important that governments, of course, um, if people are in real need, if people to address that. But how we talk about this from our perspective is that these measures should be targeted, they should be temporary, and they should be fine. And in the end, it is for the European Commission to look at this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but presently, uh, on the basis of what they see, um, if you look um, you know, to the entire euro area, many of these government uh, measures are going broader than yeah as we said, targeted, um, temporary, and tailored. And that means that... A bit more into the inflation. Specifically, um, inflation in Estonia has reached 24.8% in August, yet only around 5.5% in France. So what is the ECB currently doing to tackle the heterogeneous um, inflation rates right. within the EU? Very good. We have one single um, uh, uh, currency, Mm -hmm. single euro, single monetary policy. Now, it's true uh, that in the various member states, uh, there is still different fiscal and budgetary policy. Um, so that makes things slightly more complicated. Um, so we look at all that, um, but in the end, we look at, a, um, at the average inflation um, number, mm -hmm. um, and we address that. And that is currently too high. Yeah. It's the 10%, but it, it and needs to go back to two. The question becomes, when you have a one-size-fits-all policy, um, that there could be um, countries who say, um, the band is way too small for me. So yeah. it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit. Ah. For, yeah. for example, Estonia, they say, okay, uh, we see what you are doing, but um, uh, for us, it doesn't work. Right. Or we still have 14% uh, inflation rate uh, max. Yeah. So, so, so again, the, now, I can understand that people people uh, think that it's a little bit the price that we pay. Um, for us, what is important? Maybe uh, to bring it uh, quickly back to to the impacts this is also having on sustainable efforts. Um, I think at Springtime you you held a, a, a sustainable festival. You held an, um, 
uh, speech, um, which brought many audience members to tears, uh, as was noted by uh, Dag van Vrouw. Uh, and you talked about um, the need for companies uh, to use the money they got from the government uh, to basically uh, green their operations. So, for example, you, you gave, I think, the example of a factory uh, that then wants to go uh, big again and produce again uh, w w when. I'm failing today because nobody is still uh, the emotionally uh, unstable. <laughs> 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 emotionally unstable here, yeah. Um, no, no, but it's a very serious question. Um, what is important is that, um, and I'm going to introduce a new concept here, and that is called transition planning. What we need banks to do, and what banks need um, real economy firms to do, so all the corporates that you can think of, mm. is that they need to plan their transition. Yeah. We are going to... Um, the question is, did they take the chance that Corona offered them? They, they we all, we did a, um, a stress test, not mm -hmm. a term. So that means that you go to the banks and say, what will happen to your balance sheet if a number of unhappy things happen to you in terms of physical and transition risks? One of the findings was, now listen, one of the findings was that only 20% of the banks well, it makes me very determined yeah. to, to make, make sure that when we say that we have supervisory expectations, and I just told you that we have already said to the banks that yeah. they need to comply with those by 2024 yeah. at the latest, and it, it would be very de determined yeah. to go on on that path. I mean, it means that they look at their balance sheet, they look at their exposures, and they have exposures um, um, to fossil um, intensive industries. Mm -hmm. That's logical, because today the economy, to a large extent, is still a fossil economy. So that, to a certain extent, is unavoidable today. But they need to think about how are they going to bring that down yeah. to zero in a way that is compatible with the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, so we want to see this transition plan. The um, EU law, you have this um, Capital Requirement Directive, the CRD, Mm -hmm. um, and they are subsequent for um, How are you going to make sure that your balance sheet, that your business model, that your activities are slowly but surely, mm -hmm. um, I'd rather see fast but surely, mm -hmm. um, move on a Paris compatible path? That means that banks need to, and all financial firms, by the way, need to engage actively with their clients to make sure, and we need to make progress also in terms of uh, disclosure requirements because actually you need data from your clients and it's good if there were to be international um, standards that are harmonized so that all clients in the whole world, um, you know, ideally um, to disclose the information mm -hmm. that the financial sector needs to make this decision, but they need to challenge their clients. Yeah. yeah. And we challenge the banks. Yeah, and so, so then through the the yes. gaten, so to say. If and that gives us leverage, because we have leverage, um, have from where it came, leverage on the financial sector. The financial sector has leverage on their clients, which is the corporates and firms of this world, which is the real economy, which is the economy. And that gives us double leverage. And all those that have studied a little bit of economics, double leverage is a very powerful tool. Okay. Yeah, so you're confident that you will get there. We will get there, um, but I'm not... Uh, it's not for no reason mm -hmm. that I'm making these statements in such clear yeah. uh, words, I hope. Yeah, you know um, these words. Yeah. Um, because I think it is important uh, that people take this very seriously. Yep. And um, right now, I think this is a perfect time where we will transition to the audience for a bit. For oh, all sure. those who have audience questions, um, this is the time you should ask them. Um, yeah, we see uh, several. I think you were the first. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> in the U.S., there have been uh, predictions about uh, a recession, partially Fed-induced, uh, within the next 12 months. Of what well, they're more likely than not, people are saying. Um, you having a pretty broad view in the European economy and the European outlook not being as great as the U.S., I think. Uh, what are your thoughts on a European recession within the next 12 months? Right. Well, um, our latest uh, projections. Um, that uh, we had in front of us when we took our decisions uh, in the last monetary policy meeting uh, in September. Um, the baseline um, uh, projections would be uh, that um, uh, there would be a slowdown 
uh, and um, um, you know um, next year you would see and, and, and probably um, you know a, a, a stagnation uh, towards the end of this year next year um, I think a, a 0 0.9 uh, growth but we also said that there are risks to the downside we made a date and um, um, uh, also a, um, a scenario um, uh, for bad weather so to speak um, and there uh, we would foresee um, um, we will also uh, we have committed also to revise um, our measures um, in the years to come um, if we feel that is necessary uh, the boy in the uh, yellow jacket I, uh, I, I should make it clear that I'm a journalist uh, at Bloomberg News. Um, so I'm personally curious about your uh, rate preference for the next meeting. Uh, and second question is whether a recession will be uh, changing the path for rates. Uh, and uh, a third a quick question on, on climate uh, risks. Uh, uh, what do you think will be the outcome of thematic reviews uh, uh, on climate risks for banks? Okay. Um, thank you for um, for disclosing your um, your employer. That's that is uh, that's appreciated. Um, well, um, going forward, um, uh, we will, as I said before, we will go meeting by meeting. Um, so we are now just between uh, two meetings. So I'm not going to be uh, making any uh, statements as to um, um, uh, the uh, exact amount of uh, basis points and uh, that, that, that you would like uh, maybe to, uh, to elicit from me. I will not do that. Uh, but it's clear that we are um, uh, focused on um, uh, making sure that we take all the measures that are necessary to ensure a, you know, uh, a path uh, towards uh, our 2% uh, uh, inflation um, uh, goal uh, in the medium, uh, medium term. Um, if, uh, going to your second question, um, um, uh, in order to make sure that um, uh, the uh, demand um, uh, has to be dampened, uh, in order to make sure that um, you know it it it, it fits with the uh, still uh, limited supply, uh, and um, um, that were to be needed um, to avoid. Um, the thing anchoring of inflation expectations, we will certainly do so. As to the thematic review, um, it's a little bit early. So we, uh, we will be coming out with that um, uh, in the next period. Um, and um, I'm sure that uh, we will find moments to, uh, to, um, to explain uh, what comes out of it. For the last question, the uh, elderly uh, behind you, <laughs> professor. Elderly <laughs> board. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. You gave this very lengthy and, and comprehensive view of everything ECB is doing on climate. Now, of course, that's all a big change compared to six years ago and a change in the right direction. But with one thing that strikes me is all signaling, confronting banks with what needs to be done. But I mean, where we need to go is a truly sustainable world. Um, unsustainable has a literal meaning. It means it will not be sustained. It will disappear, it will go away. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but one day all things that are not sustainable will not be sustainable. They will not be there. Um, we, all of you also, in whatever you're going to be doing, whatever job you will, um, you need to start thinking, if you haven't done so yet, um, are you going to contribute to this? We have to do this, all of us. Um, if you're going to work for a newspaper, write about it. If you are doing these interviews, um, invite people that say something about it. Um, if you are going to work for a bank, I hope I tried to explain a little bit the things that you could do. Uh, if you're going to bring about your own role uh, in, in this as well, um, in an article uh, from 2019, uh, you went to school with what would later become a very good journalist from the NRC and a, a biographer of Mark Rutte. Um, and you said to her, um, and you wondered aloud here, I think, um, if you think about your life um, in your office in the Deutsche Bank. Uh, well, I think I'll ask my parents. I'm going to see them this afternoon. Um, I try every day to, within 
the mandate that I've been given um, to deal with the, um, the things that we need to solve. Inflation needs to come down 2%. Um, I would uh, ask for a warm applause for our guest today, Frank uh, Ayers. There is this for us to mention that we are looking for new members, a uh, lot of faces we don't know in the audience, so if you want to uh, be in the seat as well, feel free to apply, or if you're better behind the scenes, you're looking for people uh, who want to do that as well. So our, all the information is on the website. Also, next week we have another interview with Eric Cornell talking about making modern managers for those who are interested. But for today, thank you all for coming, and thank you very much, Frank Elverson, for joining us on the stage and sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.